My name is Selma Golden, and I'm the branch director at the Whitney Museum of American Art at Philip Morris. I would like to introduce you to the work of Robert Colescott, an exciting painter who has pushed the boundaries of contemporary American art. Blasting through the history of Western art, Colescott has repositioned the black presence into the foreground of our history. is it that makes the viewer take a second look? You start out saying, oh wow, and when you get up close maybe and see what you have to deal with in subject matter, then you may say, oh shit. First it's a pleasure and then it's a problem. It pulls people in and they don't quite know whether they should love it or hate it. So it's the one to punch. The first punch is the punch of just uh, the sheer visual impact of just the kind of juice that is flowing in this painting that you can't miss the minute you see it. It jumps out at you and hits you over the head. Okay, so that's the first punch. But then the second punch is exactly uh, the puzzlement, you know you've been hit, but you don't know what hit you. It was, you know, a real punch in the jaw, but it made you laugh at the same time. I didn't quite know what to make of it, but the response was immediate and irrational, namely, whatever this is, I love it and I want it, and this is something I want to connect to. So, with uh, an impulse I've seldom had in my life, sort of shoppers, passion, I thought, I want one of these pictures. You know, it's me, it hits me in the core. Looking at a painting can be done on roller skates, you know. And sometimes when people come through the galleries, it's funny because uh, I can only tell who's looking and who's not. Sometimes people come through my gallery and do a figure eight around the columns and leave, and they think they've looked at the paintings. But I promise you that it does take time to look at a painting. And so at the beginning, one only sees this and this. And then a little while later, one sees, wow, what's going on there? And then, wow, there's something else again. I first saw his work in the home of Robert Rosenblum, and that was really shocking. It was a, a takeoff on Van Gogh's The Potato Eaters, that very famous picture of his, except that all of the characters were in blackface, and he had written across the surface of the painting, Eat Them Taters. The Eat Them Taters is a takeoff on the Van Gogh potato eaters, and, and uh, it's about the, the myth of the happy darky. I just thought, well, you know, if I make it broad enough and, and stupid enough and silly enough, people might get the idea that, you know, here are these people, they're laughing and having a good time, and all they got to eat is potatoes. You know, and so there is this myth that uh, black people are always happy and they don't need much. Oh, the postcard, I've uh, saved this for 17 years, almost to the date. April 19th, 1975 it is, uh, so 17 years ago, and this is the uh, carrot that was dangled in front of me that's responsible for eat them taters. I usually don't look at them, and this one just uh, made me jump up and uh, yell because uh, I never saw anything like it before. Here was this most famous sacrosanct painting by Van Gogh, and suddenly everybody was in blackface. I immediately cottoned to it, uh, so much so that my first uh, and last instinct was, I want one. I don't know what it is, but I want it. It is a gorgeous picture. When people see it for the first time, uh, they're as dumbfounded as I and was, and don't know whether to uh, laugh or cringe. And I said, well, Mr. Colescott, I love these pictures. I even think about buying one, but I want to know what do you think uh, black people would feel about a picture like this on the wall? And he said, oh, colored folk just love my pictures. I grew up in California in the town of Oakland. There were just my mother and father and one other child, my brother. 
It was a time when everybody was struggling, and I think that made people feel something in common. It was the Depression time, and there was not much money around, and nobody seemed, and didn't seem to bother anybody much not to have a car or not to have a lot of things because they were mostly thankful that there was, if there was food on the table and a roof overhead. I did a lot of drawing on the blackboard and I did a lot of copying. I copied uh, uh, cartoons from the newspaper and then I did original things too. And when a kid makes art, which all kids do, this is part of being a kid. This is part of learning about expressing yourself, you know? And so it's real, for a child, making art is serious work. I was being encouraged by my dad and my mother to want to be in one of the professions, and they didn't consider art as one of those professions. They would have liked to see me a lawyer, I think. My father worked on the railroad. He was a waiter on the railroad. And uh, uh, Sergeant Johnson, who was actually a very well-known uh, sculptor, worked on the road with my dad, you know, wait, waiting tables. And he was a very good sculptor of, of some prominence. Uh, but he waited table. When we visited Claude Johnson's house and there were sculptures being made there, it never occurred to me that he was, you know, quote, an artist. He was this man that worked on the railroad with my father, and but he made sculptures. That was the first artist I ever knew or ever saw. He was a very good role model, and I, I look back on it and I think about its importance. I think anyone who achieves at all has to be a hard worker. And I think that an artist has to focus on what's important, and what's important is the work. So I think I have to be very sure that I'm working on the right things. I made a lot of art. The identity I wanted to have was to be an artist. And so I had to paint very hard and long hours at night to keep proving to myself that I was an artist and that I wasn't this guy that just put on a suit and tie every morning and went to teach school, that I was something more than that. And so I work, would work, I would paint. I would start about eight o'clock at night and go to the studio. I had a studio in the basement and I would go down to the basement and I would paint until three in the morning. And I had a lot of ambition and and then along the way, I got, I got encouragement. I was very success-oriented. And I think that, um, you know, whatever I basically attached myself to, I think I would have had tried to excel in it and been the best that I could be. And education was very important as a means to, to an end, to get, to, to be recognized and to earn a better living and to have a better life. If you think of the person in a way who's the most uh, honored American painter of our time, it's probably Jasper Johns. And if you think about his paintings there, they're very emotional paintings, but they're very formalized as well. There's a kind of, there's a kind of holding back of the emotion. Robert's work uh, operates completely differently. He's not holding anything back. He's throwing out more at you than you can deal with at once. In that sense, I think he's running counter to the, uh, the expectations for contemporary painting. She was Shirley Temple. And then when she married, she became black. And, um... Shirley Temple Black. And so I thought that was funny. And then it made me think, well, what if America's little sweetheart at that time in the 30s had been a little black girl? What, what kind of a society would we have been living in at that time? There would have been, it would have been a very different one. So in recasting her as a little black girl, or uh, actress, then I think I, I create a question about, you know, the kind of culture that we might, that it might have been if Shirley Temple, in fact, had been black. And it's enough to make you laugh, and it's also enough to make you a little bit uncomfortable, 
because it puts your own prejudices and it puts your own tradition in perspective and instead of beating you over the head with it, it does it in a much more sly and, if one may dare say so, enjoyable way. But it's the kind of thing that Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor do as comics, and they make you laugh and they make you uneasy at the same time. Using irony, humor, and sarcasm, Robert Colescott makes the viewer take a second look at both his intended message and the images that he's appropriated from Western art. His work has changed a lot over the years, in fact. Um, and right now, behind you, I'm looking at some paintings from 1981. They're paintings, on the one hand, of huge piles of uh, slices of cake, and then the other one is an equally huge uh, pile, really, a landscape made of, uh, of hot dogs uh, in buns. And of course, there's no story to these paintings. They're, they're an image without uh, a narrative. Robert Colescott, when he started, was insistent upon staying with a story. And the story, as I said before, is not only a personal one, but one about all of the things that are affecting us as individuals in our society. Another very provocative thing about Robert's painting was the narrative, that he actually introduced stories uh, into his art at a time when a narrative was a, was a no-no. There was, for instance, the uh, great American 19th century icon by Emanuel Lloyds of Washington crossing the Delaware, and he called it George Washington Carver crossing the Delaware, so there was a sort of black history joke right in the title. And uh, these were very clearly staged, and you recognize the picture immediately. Yeah, George Washington Carver crossing the Delaware is my title. When I was a kid in school, and studied, we studied history, there was almost no mention of uh, um, black American contribution, except there was a chapter at the back of the book, a very short chapter, and there were two or three names mentioned as people who had contributed uh, to, to American history. And there was Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver, and one or two other people mentioned. Appropriation is an art practice in which artists borrow images from popular culture, from the media, from art history at large, and use them in their work as either a comment on certain conditions in our culture or just as images that they like and want to use in the same way that artists in the past used fruit or flowers in a still life. Artists in contemporary culture use the images that are all around them. In the case of Cole Scott, it could be used in order to make very specific comments on uh, the masterpiece, make you look at a masterpiece from uh, his point of view. Mr. Colescott uh, was doing this in full blast in 1975 and in his usual way with a very, very light touch. So it was like a visit to the most famous pictures of the world museums, except that they were re-translated uh, uh, into his uh, own familiar language. And uh, there's a long tradition of that now, but he was one of the pioneers. There was this contradiction of the one or two heroes that we were allowed, and then a whole ship of fools, people that were uh, the step and fetchets and the Aunt Jemimas and so on. I created uh, George Washington Carver as the one hero, heroic person. And then all these people catching catfish off the side of the boat, you know, or drinking moonshine. I think that is one of his primary purposes, to, uh, through painting, rewrite the history of, of uh, America and actually rewrite it closer to what it uh, ought to be, namely to reintroduce the contribution in a very ironic, a very funny, a very provocative way, but make you think about what the contribution of African Americans in America was. Matthew Henson and the quest for the North Pole. You know, Henson was Admiral Peary's right-hand man and his cartographer, as well as his manservant. And Admiral Peary uh, mounted an expedition to the North Pole. When they set out for the pole, Peary failed and became ill. And it's believed, 
although Henson would never talk about it. But it is believed that Henson made it to the North Pole and Perry did not. Perry, who is supposed to have been the first one to reach the North Pole, uh, was not, in fact, the first one, but it was rather uh, this other character here, Matt Henson. But then uh, there's a lot of other things going on in this uh, painting. I pair up um, Salome and St. John the Baptist, delivering St. John the Baptist's head. And I felt like St. John, that, uh, that Peary was probably, a, could be considered a Christ figure, and Henson was sacrificed. <laughs> When I made my painting series uh, the, um, at the Bather's Pool, I wanted to talk about another standard of beauty, you know, a standard of beauty that was essentially uh, African, and so, or at least other, and so the women were, in, in that series, are generally heavy and lumpy. And then I have had women say to me something like, well, why, do, why are you making us all so fat and lumpy, you see? I said, well, wait a minute. Do you equate fat with ugly? You know, aren't, there are societies where a fat is considered beautiful. Different times have had different images of women and of men in um, prehistoric time, 20 million years ago. And she was all genital and buttocks and breasts. And so it was a, I guess it was an ideal that had a lot to do with, uh, you know, the desire for fertility and, and reproduction. And, um, and then, you know, in the Middle Ages, there was the, that ideal was a very aesthetic ideal, a very slender, very skinny woman, uh, almost no breasts, you know. And, uh, of course, people were, they transcended earthly things. They were thinking about heaven and they were thinking about hell, and I suppose if you think about those things all the time, you get skinny. in the 16th century uh, used a kind of a red-brown under their paintings and it created something in their, their finished works that's called a Venetian glow because it, the reflections uh, through the oil paint bouncing back from that uh, warm surface, you see, gave the paintings a kind of a glow. Titian would be a good example of a Venetian glow. And lately I've been using it, I've been letting some of it show. Michelangelo said that the paint, that the sculptures, the figures were already in the stone, you know. He just had to bring them out. And to some extent, I feel like there's a kind of an organism to the, uh, to the red paint that I'm using, that it's creating layers that, um, that help me sometimes to create form. You could see little pieces of bread coming through the green, the white, the brown, the black of everything. It gives the painting a, a wonderful sense of life, a wonderful sense of feeling. It's not a flat surface. The paint itself is applied in many layers. And by having carefully undercoated this painting with red, he makes the painting throb in terms of its color. So I know what I'm going to do first. I always know what I'm going to do first. I'm going to paint the canvas red. <laughs> to do the, the creative thing, I, you know, I like, I close my door and uh, I, uh, I sit around and stew for sometimes three days and then force myself to really go, go for whatever idea I'm playing with, you know. I play with maybe three or four different ideas before I get the idea that I, that I want. 
sometimes it just comes along and I've, I've got it, you know. And so, uh, but generally speaking, it's a, it's, a, it's a process of several days just to, to think about the work and think about what I want to do and what I'm feeling. Well, I think that um, it's hard to say. Things just kind of pop into my head. Uh, so sometimes it's just what I'm thinking about, or, but then sometimes I'll see somebody uh, doing something out there in the street or something, you know, and that sets off something, or I might be reading about something, or I might be listening to the radio and, uh, or the news, you know, and uh, old songs. The painting's called Emergency Room. And I got the idea because I was reading an article in the newspaper about the struggles that the hospital, the county hospital in Oakland is having. I read about the t bad conditions now in that hospital and how overworked they are and how a lot of that has to do with the drug problems and health problems that are related to it. And so I thought about emergency room and then I thought about the whole country, in a sense, having to deal with problems on a, on a kind of an emergency basis all the time, and that problems are dealt with routinely on this emergency and expedient basis. You do whatever comes to mind to try to solve this problem at the last minute, when it's a matter of life and death, and maybe it's even too late. This painting got Mr. Colescott into a great deal of trouble, particularly in Akron, Ohio, because there were some black people that felt that he was being insulting to black people. In fact, what Bob Colescott was trying to say is, look at how some white people look at us. And that is a double message. I treated the characters in the prison uh, as gorillas because I thought that so many problems are solved by, well, by caging people, locking them up, like as though, as though they were animals. You, see. you have a wild animal and you can put him in a cage, and then that takes care of it. Well, you can't deal with human beings that way. I've learned a lot about myself, I think. I've learned how to... I think I've learned how to cope with fear. I think I've learned how to cope with hatred. And I think I've, a lot of that has gotten worked out through painting it, through creating images about it, and through controlling those images and making them uh, do the things that I want them to do. I'm a very passionate person. And hopefully that passion is expressed in my painting. A great deal of what new in art since 1890 has come out of some kind of African connection or African influence. You know, the masks and the sculptures and the fetishes influenced Cubism. Um, Jackson Pollock's drips and smears and rhythmical reflowing uh, forms and lines on a canvas, you know, largely come out of uh, African-American music. And now I think um, uh, African uh, African artists and African American artists are starting to reclaim what's their own, you know? African American artists have always challenged the status quo in the art world. They have always sought to include the African American presence in the history of both our culture and our art. I see more of a thrust uh, by um, African American artists as, you know, as a kind, almost a mainstream thrust. I, I see other I, mean, I, I think that, you know, uh, th that th the artists of color are the, are right now are the avant-garde. And I think that there's a lot of the, the other, the, the people of European ancestry in America, the artists, tend to be following the black artists. And I think, I think this is what's changing. I think the, the, the tables have turned. <laughs>